I love the uh, season that we're in. Now, I'm talking about covenant-wise. I love the fact that in the Bible, seven different covenants, here we are living in the covenant that we're now in, where Christ has given us forgiveness of sins, where the covenant includes the Holy Spirit living within us, this spirit-led life. What an incredible covenant time that we live in, to have this depth of a relationship with Jesus Christ that nobody else, in fact, that's what was spoken yesterday, no other generation obtained that. And here we are, we're living in it, and Hebrew says there still is a rest that is yet to come, there's still something that is yet to come, but we live in such a powerful time. A time that truly play, plays out that song that he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. And I love the fact that I can read the scriptures and be inspired that the scriptures are God's word and it comes alive. I love the fact that God says he conceals a matter and he intends for us to discover it. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to essentially guide us to key scriptures to help us discover things. And over the last six months, as is, I guess, for many people, there are certain things that you start looking into scriptures and you have this thought that is led by the Holy Spirit and he leads you to scriptures and you discover something that just at least for you is profound. It, it, it's thought-provoking. So I want to share with you that. The year was 1981, January of 1981. Um, I was quite young then. Uh, I was attending the Revival Temple Missions Conference. And uh, Brother John Bell at that time had invited a missionary to Korea. She was a single woman. Uh, she did not know Korean very well, but God told her to go. Uh, she had an interpreter that traveled with her. I don't remember her name. I wish I did. And Brother John Bell invited her to speak. And she was talking about really every difficulty that she was facing while she was in Korea. And she made a statement. And she says, I did at that moment what every believer must do at some point in time. They must just stop and wait upon the Lord and do nothing. Sometimes we must do nothing. Now what you need to know is that when I was in school, one of my teachers, as we were kind of hanging around, me and my friends in the hallway, the teacher was trying to get by, and she addressed me, and she says, Philip, listen, you've got to either lead, follow, or get out of the way, but you have to do something. And that impacted me. And I, okay, I got to do something. I got to do something. So then I'm sitting in the pews of Revival Temple at the top of the hill. Destiny Church used to be called Revival Temple. And I'm hearing that. And I remember turning to my dad, who was a missionary, and I go, Dad, is that really an option? To do nothing. And he says, son, sometimes that is the only thing that you can do, is do nothing and wait on the Lord. The reason I'm bringing this up is probably the last 20 books that I have read, there is this call, this compelling call to, I guess, the next generation, do something. Lead, follow, or get out of the way, but do something. Do something, do something. And I've been raised on this urge to do something. And recently, the last six months, as we started to make some changes in our church, I've been turning the main campus that I've pastored for 23 years over to Pastor Casey Carey. He preached here yesterday. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling this pressure to do something and the Lord just keeps telling me, Philip, maybe right now you need to do nothing. So I want to add to your tool chest this idea of all the tools that allow you to do something, empower you to do something at the height of your empowerment. I want to tell you that there are moments in time, like that Korean missionary said, that you do nothing. Now, there is a word that now appears in our English dictionary, and it is borrowed from the German language because there is no other word that actually describes this idea of doing nothing and the reason for doing it. And that German word that is used in the English now is Zugzwang. And if you have a way of taking a photo, I encourage you, take a photo of this because it's a word that I want you to remember, Zugzwang. Now, if you speak German you'll know that I'm speaking, pronouncing it absolutely wrong, but since it is now in the dictionary and it's now an English word, Zugzwang, it's appropriate for us to say that. Will you say Zugzwang? 
Zugzwang. That's how we get people to speak in tongues. Repeat that five or six. I'm joking. Bad joke. It kind of sounds that way, but Zugzwang literally means this, and it is most common in the game of chess. When your opponent has backed you into a corner, it's your move, you're compelled to make a move. If you move the knight, he takes your queen. If you move the bishop, he puts you in check. If you move the pawn, it's checkmate. And so you would rather make no move at all. Zugzwang. It is a situation in which the obligation to make a move in one's turn is a serious, often decisive disadvantage. And the Lord began to speak to me that sometimes, Philip, in the midst of all of your activity, maybe there's times when you just need to zook Wayne, that the next move will actually create for you a disadvantage. There is a Hebrew word, a combination word, which is press to move. And I found this word in the 1992 David Stern, who's a Jewish man who wrote the Jewish New Testament commentary. And he talks about this compelling to move, and yet Jesus decides not to. We find this in the book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 9, where Jesus appears both before Herod and before Pontius Pilate, and Jesus refuses to speak, particularly to Herod. Now, to Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate says, hey, I have the power of life and death over you. And Jesus says, no, you really don't. My heavenly Father has given you this power, but ultimately those that delivered you unto me, delivered me unto you have the greater sin. But he absolutely refused to speak to Herod. And Herod is trying to zugzwang him, move him, back him into a corner, try to get him to do something. And we find it similar in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 40, where the people who have crucified Christ are standing around and they taunt him by saying, well then, if you are the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. You said that you would tear down the temple in three days you'd build it up again. They're taunting him. Now to understand the emotions that Jesus is feeling at that moment, we can turn to Psalms chapter 22, where King David, in a prophetic setting, he sees himself on the cross, he's perceiving and feeling all of the feels that Jesus is feeling, and in Psalms chapter 22, This is how David describes the emotions of Christ, beginning with verse 16, my enemies. They surround me like a pack of dogs, demanding that I make a move. Come down from there, but I will not. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. That's how we know that David is talking about Jesus on the cross. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all of my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothes. Oh, Lord, do not stay far away. You are my strength. Come quickly to my aid. Jesus, no doubt, must have pondered this 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 surrounding of dogs, this this gang of people that have come in, he may have thought, yeah, I'll, I'll show them, I'll come down. But to make that move, to come down from the cross, would have put the entire plan of the universe at a disadvantage. So on the cross, he chooses to zugzwang, he chooses to do nothing except to carry through with what God had commissioned him to do in the hour in which that he did that. So the point is, sometimes we have to just zugzwang because the next move that we make may put us at a disadvantage. So I want us to add that to our tool chest for you to further understand this. I'm a grandfather of seven grandchildren, and I love being a grandpa. Now, every one of them, when they're old enough to walk, this is what I do whether they come to my house or I go to theirs, as soon as I walk into the door or they walk into the door, I stand up as if I'm this grizzly bear and I start walking towards them growling. And of course, whether they've got a bottle or some type of other thing in their mouth, they'll of course start to turn left and then I can fast uh, intercept them and then they turn right and I fast can intercept them. And step by step, I'm slowly backing them either against the couch or against a corner or something. And then when they can't get away from me, I reach down and I grab and give them this big old bear hug. How many of y'all have done that as grandparents? You don't know what you're missing out. It's great. (laughs) But there's always this clause 
That as I'm getting closer to them, if they don't really want me to bear hug them, they can always cry out, Nana, Nana. And of course, here comes Nana, swoops, picks them up, gives them a big old hug. And of course, I grab their arms and I start, no, he's my grandchild. And then she's like, no, he's mine. And no, he's mine. And of course, he thinks it's hilarious because we're fighting over him and love him. The child at that moment feels zugzwanged, backed into a corner. And whatever they do next is to some degree putting them at a disadvantage. But there is always <clears throat> this key rescue. Nana is the key rescue. And this goes on in my family until they become like teenagers, pre-teenagers, and you go over to their house and they're doing their homework and you approach them and go, ah, and they just kind of roll their eyes, look at you, and then turn back to the newspaper or the, whatever their uh, homework or whatever it is that they're doing. Ah, just wait, he'll be there before you know it. So there's three things. Three identifiable things that I want you to be aware of that if you are zugzwanged, you should do nothing. The first one is when the move that you are contemplating making violates your conscience. Do not move if it violates your conscience. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 14, 22. Blessed is he, happy is he who does not condemn himself in the things that he approves, that does not condemn himself in what he approves. I remember I was on staff here, Pastor John Bell and David Bell. They were co-pastoring at that time. The intention was John Bell would begin to pass things over to David Bell. And I remember that David Bell was instituting some changes. Brother John Bell had short worship and long preaching. Brother David Bell had long worship and short preaching. And this was a concern to Brother John Bell. Another thing is that Brother uh, David Bell was allowing things like jeans on the stage. Brother John Bell always wore a suit and tie. And so Brother uh, David Bell, Pastor David Bell, was you know, promoting that some of these changes needed to happen and worship. And so one of those days I had to go up to the office. John Bell was in there. And John Bell asked me this question. Hey, Philip, have a seat. And I said, sure. I, I was just there to deliver some, pap some papers. He says, what do you think about these changes the pastor David Bell wants to make. I was feeling a little zugzwanged right there. And I, and, and I will tell you that what I discovered about John Bell is that he was never opposed to change. I discovered in that dialogue with him in that office, he was never opposed to change. You may think that he was, he never was. Let me tell you what he was opposed to. He did not want to make any changes that would violate his conscience. What he was looking for was somebody to give him a compelling argument that would settle this, this tearing inside of him. Do we make these changes or do we not? It seems like we're deviating from a pretty important principle, short worship, much scripture. So he says, Philip, what do you think about that? And I said, Brother Bell, honestly, I like the changes. He said, well, what do you think about this long worship and short, shorter word? I said, I said, Brother Bell, I said, you've taught us the single most important thing is to be spirit-led. And what I know is that when Brother David Bell leads worship, the Spirit of the Lord comes, and he's giving us revelation through the song, and he's given us inspiration through the songs, and he's given us illumination through the song. And his songs have so much word in it, and we're feeling the presence of the Lord. He looked at me, and he says, okay, thank you. I left. Now, by no means do I think that I was the one that somehow til tilted the scales to allow the changes. But I do, I do know that he asked other people. He was asking the elders. And what I discovered that day is that John Bell was not opposed to change. He just simply wanted a compelling argument that would give him a clear conscience because he did not want to condemn himself in the things that he approves. Now, in this season of my life, there's changes. My staff ask me for changes, and the question that I keep asking them is based upon what? Give me a compelling argument that will cause me to have an absolute clear conscience before the Lord. Demonstrate to me that this is the absolute best thing for us to do. And once they do that, of course, I'm totally in favor of change. But absent of a clear conscience, I am at a disadvantage if I make a move. Make no move that puts you at a disadvantage. Let me give you a biblical case study. 
Moses has come down from the mountain. He has the plans for the building of the tabernacle. He's been instructed by God that Aaron is to become the new priest. He goes through the whole ceremonies. If there's a sin offering, you're supposed to take this uh, goat or whatever the sin offering is. You sacrifice that to the Lord. And because you're the priest, you and your family, you can take a portion of this meat. And you're supposed to take it into your home and then you can eat that. But be sure that you celebrate before the Lord. He says that over and over again in Deuteronomy. Celebrate before the Lord whenever you take one of the sacrifices, one of the portions of the sacrifice. So Aaron's understood this. The sons of Aaron have understood this. And all of a sudden, Leviticus chapter 9 and 10, the sons of Aaron offer strange fire on the altar and they're struck dead. So Moses comes to Aaron and says, Aaron, look, you need to do the sin offering as I told you, but you cannot mourn. You cannot make it seem at all that you're disappointed in what God has done. So Aaron and now the other sons that have taken the, son, the place of the two sons that were struck dead, they do this. And I can just picture in my mind Aaron standing over this altar and the sacrifice is being brought and it's being offered unto the Lord. And Aaron right there and then makes the decision to let the entire offering burn before the Lord instead of taking a portion of the meat. So Moses comes and inquires and here we pick up the passage, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 16. Moses then asked them what had happened to the goat of the sin offering. When he discovered it had been burnt up, he became very angry with Eleazar and Ithmar, Aaron's remaining sons. Why didn't you eat the sin offering in the sacred area that he demanded? It is a holy offering the Lord has given if given to you to remove the guilt of the community and to purify the people, making them right with the Lord. In verse 19, then Aaron answered Moses, Today my sons presented both their sin offerings and their burnt offerings to the Lord, and yet this tragedy has happened to me. If I had eaten the people's sin offering on such a tragic day as this, would the Lord have been pleased? This is what he's saying. Which one should I have chosen? To eat the meat or to celebrate before the Lord? But I would have been a hypocrite because I right now cannot celebrate before the Lord. I just lost my two sons. I'm in this period of mourning. I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So which was the best thing to do? So Aaron says, I deduced that for me to not violate my conscience, I let the entire offering be burnt. And as soon as he says that, this is what it says in verse 20, and when Moses heard this, he was satisfied. That's all I'm asking from my staff. Just give me a compelling argument. We'll make the changes. If my conscience can be clear, like Moses, I'll be satisfied. I found that about John Bell. So if you find yourself being pressured into somehow making moves, making changes, doing things, listen, heed my caution. Do not make a move out of Zug's Wayne. It will put you at a disadvantage, especially if it violates your conscience. Second. Second. In fact, actually, let me back up. Let me back up a little bit. I have heard it said that ministry is oftentimes making a choice between two evils. And I made a decision at some point, I guess early in my ministry, that is not really an option. To somehow choose the lesser of two evils is still choosing an evil. And what I've discovered is that there is no trial so great that God will not provide me the way of escape thereof. That is, no matter how much the devil may try to back me up against the couch or back me up against the corner, there is always this cry for Nana, Nana, save me, Holy Spirit, save me, God, save me, give me this way of escape, that somehow he always comes in and he rescues me. Listen, the days of choosing between, no, between two evils in your own personal ministry and life need to be over. So do not choose the lesser of two evils. Choose only that which is righteous. For that can I hear an amen. Don't violate your conscience. Secondly, when you're zugzwang backed into a corner and you're contemplating making a move, sometimes we must do nothing when the move actually makes things worse. It's amazing how many times people make a move because they're compelled, I got to do something. Sometimes they choose the lesser of two evils. Little do they know that they're actually making things worse. In our pastoral staff, if I'm ever about to make a major decision of some sort, major changes, I ask the elders, the pastors, I want you to right now just tell me all of the unintended consequences. What could possibly go wrong? 
And they don't hold back. They tell me everything that could possibly go wrong, split the church in half, half of our money's be gone, half of your staff leave. Oh, that's all? What else could possibly go wrong, right? And so they, they start to do that. Okay, what, what can we do to somehow mitigate this? There was a gentleman that would come to my office quite often. He would sit there across from my desk, and he would tell me everything that he was going to do. And by the way, if you're in ministry, when people ask to see you, they usually have one of two ideas in their heads. They either are coming really to ask your advice, they sincerely want to know what you think, or really they just want to tell you what they're thinking, and only if you see like a major, major issue, they want you to interrupt them. So they really want to just kind of tell you what they're thinking is one, and the other one is they really want your advice. So there was this gentleman that would often come to my office, and uh, he would tell me everything that he was going to do. And so I would ask him a couple of questions, and inevitably, every time he would make a move, he just got deeper and deeper into debt. He got further and further away from his family. And finally, one day, probably about the 10th visit, I actually stopped him, and I heard this from another minister, but he started to tell me what he, and I said, I said, hey, listen, your best thinking has gotten you into this mess. Your best thinking has gotten you where you're at. Do you see improvement or do you see like you're kind of slowly going downhill? See, yeah, I'm kind of going downhill. Then how about if you get some advice? Listen to some advice. I will give it to you. Do you want my advice? He goes, yeah, yeah. So I told him. And from that point on, he called one of the other pastors in our church and started to take counsel from them. Really tell them what it was that he was thinking. And you know that. Some people make moves because they don't know what to do. And again, the last 20 books that I've read, it's all compelling to make a move. And I'm concerned that there's this new thought that we have to do something, lead, follow, or get out of the way, but do something. And I'm telling you, sometimes you need to do nothing, especially if the move that you're about to make is going to make things worse. Genesis chapter 31, 24. Jacob has fled from Esau. He's now come to the family of his mother. He's living with Laban. And uh, Laban makes a statement. He says, I, I'm prospering because of you, Jacob. There's actually this idea that Laban is prospering. And Laban knows that, that Jacob being around causes Laban to prosper. And so Laban is prospering incredibly. But so is Jacob. He's worked 14 years. He has his two wives. Now he's made a partner in the business. And uh, every time that there's any type of loss, uh, Jacob ends up taking the loss. But Jacob is prospering. And wouldn't you know that the brother-in-laws, that is the sons of Laban, start to get jealous of that. And um, pretty soon Jacob gets the hint, well, I'm just not welcomed here. My brother-in-laws are like, you know, they, they're just, they're seeing this prosperity. And they made the statement, Jacob only prospers because of dad. But dad knows, dad knows that he's prospering because of Jacob. He gets it, but the, the sons don't. The brother-in-laws, they don't get that. So Jacob decides to leave. So he leaves and he goes to the hill country. And when Laban finds out about it, he gets his men of war and they hightail after him towards the hill country. And the night before they're going to connect, God speaks to Laban and he gives him this passage, Genesis 31, 24. He says, and God said to Laban or came to Laban, the Syrian, in the dream by night and said unto him, take heed that you speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Now I pondered that for a while. Make sure that you don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now I'm going to give you the thought behind this. The thought behind this is actually found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. See, God said to Abraham, Abraham, anybody who blesses you, I will bless. And anybody who curses you, I'm going to curse. As if God is saying, look, I'm looking out for you, Laban, just like Balaam's donkey looked out for him. I'm trying to help you not make a crucial mistake. Jacob wants you blessed. He came here to bless you. But you're about to make a move that's going to make things worse on you. So best thing you can do is shut up. Because if you curse him, I'm obligated by the promise that I gave to Abraham to curse you. So it's best that you say nothing. Now, he woke up the next morning, connected with Jacob, and he posed a question. Why did you do this? As opposed to making a statement, he posed a question, why have you done this? Now, there are people who come to our church and they bless me. Thank God, they bless me. And they bless me and I feel blessed, and I'm going to give a number to it. I feel 10% blessed. And so I pray a blessing on them. And then I see them blessed 90%, 100%, 150%. And it is so easy 
for me to start saying, well, you know, they're blessed because I prayed for their blessing. And I can start to withdraw that, withhold that, and eventually it just brings a mistake onto me. So missionaries, if you're being blessed to whatever degree, 10% at a time, bless the people that bless you. Sometimes a church is blessing somebody else more than you, and you make a move that makes it worse. Pastors, you may be contemplating, ah, you know, cutting missions. Listen, you're blessed because of the giving to missionaries. Be careful what you're about to do because the thing that you're about to do may be inevitably a huge mistake. Sometimes it's best to just do nothing until you have everything cleared up. We're about to make some major changes in our missions program. I'm asking everybody that I possibly know to help me come up with the new rules of engagement between pastors and missionaries. I really want to be guided by a clear conscience. I want to do what is absolutely right for the missionaries, absolutely right for our congregation. I want to do what is right, and I will not make a move if it violates my conscience and if I perceive that it's going to make things worse. Let me talk to you about, is that, am I out of town, town, time? 159, I am. All right, let me get you to the third point. Third point here. Third thing, do not make a move when the move belongs to someone else. And I'll wrap this up quickly. <clears throat> King David had been opposed by two people, Abner and a guy by the name of Shimei. So David has declared, Solomon, you're going to be my successor. And this is found in 1 Kings chapter 2. And before David passes, he says, now look, Solomon, there's two people in the kingdom that you need to use great wisdom with and take care of them. He actually says, don't let them go to the grave with gray hair. Take care of them. Now, I'm going to tell you this, that sometimes you need to not make a move because God intends someone else to make the move. And I'll tell you, David did not make a move. It did not belong to him. The move belonged to Solomon, and Solomon did take care of it. He took care of this man by the name of Joab, and he took care of this man by the name of Shimei. I was sitting at a meeting, a member of our church who had been a long-standing member of our church, and I was in this meeting, he was posing some questions, and the questions were somewhat confrontational. And because I've had some good history with them, and this person has become more and more comfortable with me, this person started really pushing back on me a little bit degrading in his tone. So then he poses a question, well, don't you think we should do this? And my associate pastor was sitting right there, and so I paused a little bit to think about it because I'm a little bit more political, smooth, you know, careful about what I say. And my associate pastor immediately spoke up, and he said, well, that's just not, that's just not the way it's supposed to be. And he just kind of laid it out. This is the way it's supposed to be. And I kind of I thought for a minute, and, and the person that, that had heard my associate pastor say that stepped back a little bit, and then posed another kind of question confrontational thing. And, and it, it just was inappropriate. The way this person was behaving towards us, it just simply was uh, inappropriate. And after the second question was asked, looks at me, expects me to answer, and I'm about to answer, and I just delayed. And once again, the associate pastor spoke up. And, um, and it dawned on me. It wasn't for me to answer this person because this associate pastor is eventually going to rise up and become the pastor. And, you know, we have people in our kingdom, we have people in our realm, in our church, that they, they push back and they become comfortable. You know, Joab got comfortable mouthing off to David, and the Simei got comfortable mouthing off. And, and David says, these people have been sent from the Lord. But Solomon, they weren't sent from the Lord to vex you. And there are people who are in ministry that have maybe been sent to vex a previous generation. And if you have been sent to vex a previous generation, be careful because the new generation may have to make a move. And just because you became comfortable and there were rules of engagement and ethic that governed that then doesn't mean, and that means for us too, the, the rest of us, we, we, we found these boundaries, we, we answer a certain way. But as I turned the campus over, in this case to Pastor Casey, who isn't who I was referring to, but Pastor Casey, as he's taking the reins and, and he's making some changes, and I want to go with him, a clear conscience. I don't want a move that's going to make things worse, but there are some moves that just no longer belong to me. They now belong to them. So now there's a time for me to just sit back and say, oh, God, 
I feel zugzwinged. I feel cornered. I feel trapped. I want to make a move. And the devil who stands there and says, make a move, make a move, like Jesus who was on the cross, or at times when I think I've just cast off this cross, I don't want to carry this cross anymore. I don't want to be zugzwinged anymore. God simply says to me, Philip, just wait, just wait. There is a way of escape because there's no trial so great. God will not provide a way of escape thereof. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. And will you stand, please, at this time? And I want to invite you to do this. So I walk into my house and my grandkids, I do this, Arr! and my grandson, who's now a teenager, looks at me, this was a couple years back, and he just has this look of disdain, like, I'm too old to put up with this nonsense. Do me a favor, will you put that look, imagine you're a teenager, I'm growling at you and you're like, I just, I just don't have time to put up with this disdain. Let me see that look. Brilliant. Brilliant. So when the devil comes and he backs you into a corner, I want you to just look at him, roll your eyes, and just say, I don't have time for this nonsense. There is a way of escape thereof, and God's going to provide it. So just, I'm going to sit still. I'm not going to be compelled to move. I'm not going to be forced to move. There is a way of escape, and God has it for me because he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he says that I am his own, and that's the covenant we live in. Can I hear an amen? Amen.